Well, hello once again. Welcome to another Crime Dive Halloween edition. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So yeah, let's go ahead and talk about some. If you're also drawn to true crime and you want to feel better about your own makeup skills, you should absolutely, if you want, like, subscribe, and let's hang out together every other Tuesday where I will take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. So yeah, happy Halloween. Halloween. I hope it is uh, going well for you. Let me know if uh, you had any plans this past weekend or are going to this upcoming weekend. And uh, whatever you choose to do, whenever you choose to do it, I just hope you are safe and happy out there. And now let's talk about today's case, which is like kind of fitting for, you know, Halloween since today is Halloween and all. It is a creepy case. It is from the 1940s and it went unsolved. Like it's, it's cold and it's really bizarre. Today, we will be talking about the Phantom Killer out of Texarkana. And just real quick, it's really funny. So this town that we'll be talking about, Texarkana, it's very interesting. We'll, we'll get all into it. But it's funny, I was talking to uh, my, my casting director, Dee, who I you know do work for because I'm a casting assistant. And I was telling her about this case that I was going to do. And she's from Texas. And I was like, oh, yeah, have you heard of this case? And she hadn't. But she you know knew about Texarkana. And it's funny, I was telling her about it. And I was calling it Texarkana. Kana, because that's just, I don't know what I naturally thought. And she's like, no, 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 it's Texarkana. But she was joking, like, oh, no, no, all, all of us in Texas, we mispronounce stuff all the time. So, like, yeah, she was saying, like, yeah, yeah, it sounds like you should be saying it, Texarkana. But no, it's Texarkana. So, anyway, yeah, today's case. Well, it is a two parter because, wow, there is a lot to this case, way more than I initially thought. So, you know, it's from the 1940s. So, I was, you know, digging through all of the, the old newspaper articles and whatever else I could find. But I did read a book for this case, which just gave so much more information as most books tend to do. So I went ahead and read this book. It's The Phantom Killer, Unlocking the Mystery of the Texarkana Serial Murders, The Story of a Town in Terror by James Presley. That is a mouthful of a title. So we'll just call it The Phantom Killer by James Presley. This is the book that I read and is where I got a lot of information in addition to like old newspaper articles. So for today, part one, we will get into the murders. All right. The, the crimes that happened, we will get a little bit into the terror that beset the whole community, because that's really what it was with this case is it very much reminded me of like the Zodiac killer, you know, perhaps um, like those kinds of cases where, yeah, people were being hunted down at night, usually couples, and they were gunned down. And the fear that that took over this whole community, the whole surrounding area was really wild. So we'll dive a little bit more into that, more so in part two, but we will touch on it here in part one. And part two, we will get into, yeah, the, the suspects. There were suspects. There were many people who thought, you know, these certain people committed the crimes. But yeah, officially, it remains unsolved. And yeah, with all that said, uh, before we get into it, let's see, trigger warning. We will be talking about some gruesome details, like, of of, of where the victims were shot, you know, and like the bullet trajectories and that kind of stuff. So not like too, too gruesome, but like a little bit of detail. Um, other than that, I think, I think we're good. May, there might be like an F-bomb here or there. I can't remember um, in some quotes, but yeah, nothing too, too gruesome, but we will be getting into the details of like where the victims were shot and all that stuff. Alrighty. And uh, with that, let's, let's get into it because there's a lot to go over. All right. So like I said, this case takes place in Texarkana. Now, Texarkana is located in the northeastern corner of Texas or the southwestern edge of Arkansas, however you want to look at it. Now, uh, the book that I read, the James Presley book that I read, uh, described Texarkana as the abandoned stepchild of the two states, Texas and Arkansas. So Texarkana consists of two states, which we will get into in just a moment. But it also spills over near the boundaries of Louisiana and Oklahoma. And interestingly enough, it is actually closer to Lake Michigan than its sister city that lies on the border to Mexico. So like I said, 
Even though Texarkana is spoken of as one city, it is actually a shorthand term for two cities. Remember we said it consisted of two states? Yeah, it's two cities in two different states. There's Texarkana, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. Now, each of these cities has their own mayor, their own municipal government, their own police, and their own firefighters. But they do share utilities and a chamber of commerce. So a pretty interesting, unique place that we'll be talking about today. And I do apologize if there's a little extra background noise. My stupid neighbors are having, I don't know, I don't know, they're doing something out there and they're they're pretty loud with a bunch of people. So just bear with me, please. So yeah, Tex Arcana is where these murders happen. This is like the, the general area we will be talking about. And yeah, it's a pretty unique set of circumstances, right? Like, I thought that was so weird. Like, yeah, there's Texarkana. There's Texarkana, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. So wild. So let's let, let's get into it, all right? We are going to dive into the year of 1946, all right? In Texarkana, both Texas and Arkansas, all right? So the, the whole area. In 1946 is the time period that this all occurs in. It is the time period that we will be dropping into. Specifically, let's drop into February of 1946. So Jimmy Mac Hollis was 25 years old and Mary Jean Larry was 19. Not a huge fan of this age gap, but I digress. So Jimmy and Mary here were each in the process of a divorce when they met in February of 1946. Jimmy had been born in 1920 in Little Dubok in northern Louisiana near the Arkansas state border. And when Jimmy was only a few months old, his family moved to El Dorado, Arkansas. And it was here where they opened a general store along with a restaurant hoping to profit off of the huge oil boom that was happening in the area. You know, like a lot of people were flocking these places where oil was rich and and so Jimmy's family wanted to cash in on that. So, you know, they opened a general store and a restaurant to, you know, serve the, the growing population. Now, El Dorado is located several hours east of Texarkana along Highway 82. And it is here where Jimmy, his two brothers, and his two sisters primarily grew up. The family would later move to California, and later on, when World War II picked up, Jimmy had plans to join the Navy, you know, and go serve. But due to a congenital heart defect, he was ineligible. So instead, he opted for a job in aircraft manufacturing in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, it was during this time that he would actually sing in a dance band and would meet and marry his first wife, a woman named Dora Louise Nichols. And they would marry in December of 1942. He was 22 and she was 19. The couple ended up settling in El Dorado, but by January of 1946, the two separated and Jimmy moved to Texarkana. And this is where his brothers lived and he filed for divorce in El Dorado. I think before he left. Jimmy moved in with his brother Bob on the Arkansas side of Texarkana and he got a job at Reliable Life Insurance Company. And this is where his other brothers, Robert Jr. and Edmund already worked. So they got their brother an insurance job there. Specifically, I believe he was an insurance salesman. So that was Jimmy Mac Hollis. Now let's get a little bit into Mary here, all right? Mary had been born in 1927 in Tishomingo, Oklahoma. And when the war boom came, uh, that is when Mary's father moved the family to Texarkana. And he found a job at the Red River Ordnance Depot, which was a shell loading plant. When government housing became more available, Mary's father moved the family to East Hooks Court, which was a short distance from the depot. I believe it was still within the Arcana city limits as well. And it is in Hooks where Mary would attend high school. Now, Mary met her first husband, Roland L. Stretch Larry, who was 18, in Texarkana. And she married him in 1943 at the Miller County Courthouse, which was on the Arkansas side of the city. Now, Mary was only 16 years old at the time. Roland was 18, but Mary was only 16. But she lied about her birth date and said that she was 18. But surprise, surprise, the marriage didn't really last. Roland went into the Navy, and by the time the war was over, so too was their relationship in their marriage. Roland ended up going to college in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, which was about 80 miles from Texarkana, and Mary moved back to Hooks to live with her family. And by the end of 1945, the separation was permanent, and by January of the next year, 1946, the divorce was final. So it's around this time that Jimmy met Mary. So Jimmy met Mary and then asked her out on a double date for the evening of February 
22, 1946. We're going to double date with Jimmy's younger brother, Bob, and a girl named Virginia Lorraine Fairchild, who would actually end up being Bob's, like, lifelong wife, which I thought that was super sweet. The four saw a movie called Three Strangers at the Paramount Theater. The movie let out about a quarter after 10, and the four then drove in Jimmy's old model gray Chevrolet to a driving cafe to have a snack. Jimmy then dropped his brother and Virginia off at their homes, and then started the drive to Hooks, where, as we know, Mary lived. By 11 p.m., Jimmy and Mary were driving onto New Boston Road, which was on the Texas side of town, and it would take them to Highway 82, westward towards Hooks. But first, Jimmy decided to detour to a graveled road called Richmond Road. This was about north of town, and Jimmy said that both he and Mary were, quote, young and frivolous, and they followed this road about 100 yards, was past the last row of city houses, and then they turned off onto a dirt lane where they then parked. Now, this spot right here was known as, like, a, a pretty popular makeout spot for, you know, the teens and the young kids, because, you know, parking in your car and making out and stuff was like totally a thing to do. Not that it's not a thing today, but you know, it was like, like an actual, like, you know, really like big thing in, in that day. This area right here where Jimmy and Mary were was about a mile north of the Beverly Heights housing tract that had just been put in at that time. It was put in there as part of the rural community that was there called Pleasant Grove. And there's actually a central mall located there today. So Jimmy and Mary, you know, parked in this nice secluded spot and they just started talking. Jimmy talked about his experience in the dance band even singing for Mary a little bit. Now, about 10 minutes or so after they had parked, Jimmy said for some reason he he got out of his car and he, he studied the night sky. He was looking for any stars. There had been some like light rain and fog earlier that day and he was scoping out to see how clear the sky was at this time. And he said as he stood there kind of staring at the sky trying to find a star, all of a sudden a bright beam of light shined right into his eyes. It was a beam from a flashlight. And from around like the light that blinded him, Jimmy could see like the barrel of what looked like a gun pointed at him. Now, that's what the book said is that like Jimmy had had stepped out of the car was surveying the, the sky when all of a sudden this, this flashlight appeared and blinded him, which was just interesting because newspaper articles that initially reported on this incident that we'll get into, said that Jimmy and Mary were actually inside the car talking when the man approached and shown the, shown, shined? The, the flashlight in Jimmy's eyes. So I just thought that was uh, an interesting discrepancy there. Um, again, it's not like initial newspaper articles even today reporting on incidents um, are all that correct, right? So not too shocked that there's probably some discrepancies. Um, I definitely trust the book more because it was written by like an actual, you know, um, I think they said he had a degree in his history or something like that. But like, yeah, actual research. But I just thought it was interesting to include what uh, initial newspapers uh, reported on. But either way, right? So either way, Jimmy has this, this light shining in his face, right? And then all of a sudden there was a voice from behind this light and it told Jimmy, quote, take off your fucking pants. Now, you know, Jimmy would later say at first, he thought this was like some sort of like horrible prank or something like, okay, this, this guy must think that like, I don't know, I'm his buddy or something? Like, clearly he has me mistaken for someone else, right? Like, what the hell? And so he said, quote, fella, you got me mixed up with someone else. You've got the wrong man. But that's when the voice with the flashlight stepped closer to him and said, quote, I don't want to kill you, fella, so you better do what I tell you. Take off your goddamn pants now. Now, the newspaper articles that said that Jimmy and Mary were in the car when this happened said that the driver had ordered them outside of the car and then ordered Jimmy to take his, quote, britches off. Now, uh, it is said though, like after, after this, right? After, after this, this voice, this, this man is telling him like, yeah, take off your fucking pants or whatever. Like Jimmy's like, he's kind of frightened because, you know, he, he would later say like, dude, this voice, like this guy was clearly angry and hostile, you know? It really frightened him. And it is said Mary, seeing what was happening, just told Jimmy, quote, Jimmy, please take them off, hoping that like, okay, let's just, let's, let's give this guy what he wants. And maybe he'll just, you know, I don't know, like rob us and go away or something, you know? So Jimmy, not really having any other choice, started loosening, you know, his trousers. And as he got one leg out of his pants, it is said that is when the man strode up to Jimmy and slammed him hard twice in the head, knocking him to the ground and knocking Jimmy's glass, like glasses right off his face. Mary would later say that the noise was so loud, she thought for sure Jimmy had just been shot. 
what she actually heard, guys, was his skull fracturing from the man hitting him. Once Jimmy was on the ground, the man came up and started kicking Jimmy hard. And Jimmy would later say that he could feel like metal cleats in the man's shoes or boots. The man then struck Jimmy again on the head. And Mary, at this point, believing that the man just wanted to rob them, like grabbed Jimmy's trousers, that which had fallen on the ground, to get out Jimmy's wallet to show the guy that like, look, dude, we don't have like any money if that's what you want. Although the book I read did say that he got no more than $20 from Jimmy's wallet. Now, Mary said when she got out of the vehicle, she saw that the man was wearing a, a cloth hood. She said it reminded her of like a pillowcase with eye holes cut out of it. And she said that when she showed, you know, the man Jimmy's wallet, he said that like she must be lying. And I guess he proceeded to then like check Jimmy's trousers himself as Jimmy kind of lay there on the ground. I, I'm not sure if he was fully unconscious at this point, but he was definitely like groggy, if nothing else. And when the assailant couldn't really find anything else, he then demanded to know where Mary's purse was. And Mary said she didn't have one, which really anchored the assailant. The man then struck Mary with a blunt object, maybe the gun. Uh, Mary would later say that it felt like she was hit with a lead pipe. It was so hard. And I believe she did crumple to the ground, but she did manage to get back up. And when she did, the man had shouted at her to, quote, take off, run. And that's exactly what she did. She started running towards like this ditch, but the man then told her like, no, don't go that direction, run up the road. And as she started running up the gravel road, which was difficult because she was wearing heels, she heard the man turn his attention back to Jimmy and start like beating him again. Mary then spotted a car parked off the road. And for a split second, she was like, oh my God, somebody there to help me. But unfortunately, when she ran up to the car, there was nobody inside. Then out of nowhere, the man just appeared before Mary again. And he asked her why she was running. And Mary was like, you told me to run. And the man didn't believe Mary and said that she was a goddamn liar. Now, Mary said at this point, she was petrified. Like, not only did this guy sound very hostile and angry, he also sounded like he was maybe a little not all the way there mentally, you know, and she thought for sure he was going to kill her right then and there. He then hit Mary again, which caused a large gash in her scalp and it crumpled her to the ground. And as soon as she was on the ground, the assailant was on top of her. She felt him forcefully yank down her underwear. And then she felt what seemed like the muzzle of the gun insert her. And the man proceeded to sexually assault Mary with the muzzle of the gun. Oh my God. I can't imagine the the terror. Oh my God. Like it, it just, ugh. It, it like creeps me out just like reading those bare bones details of it. Like I cannot imagine. But yeah, that is what 19 year old Mary went through. Mary said that it was very painful and that she cried and she begged for him to stop because it hurt. And she did note that it was just like with the barrel of the gun, like the man himself never tried to like like assault her or even like grope her or touch her or anything. She said after the assault, she somehow managed to get to her feet. And this is where we don't really know what happened because Mary said she blacked out immediately like after the assault. So she's not quite sure what happened. Um, she knows that she managed to get to her feet and she remembered feeling very humiliated and just like wanting the guy to just like kill her already because she just felt so degraded and humiliated after that. And she even said to him at some point, like, just go ahead and kill me already. But he wouldn't. Mary didn't remember how she would say uh, two different things later because, again, she was sort of like blacked out and probably like in shock. So she didn't know, but she did manage to get away from him. At first, she thought maybe he intended to force her into his car. Maybe that was the car she had stumbled upon when she first came running down the road. But he suddenly stopped in the middle of the road and just like walked away. And then later, she thought maybe the approaching headlights of an oncoming vehicle had like scared him away. But either way, all she knew was that she was able to get away from the man and the man disappeared and she just took off running looking for help. She would continue running about a half a mile down the road and she stopped across the first home that she saw. She pounded on the front door begging for help and just at that moment a car rolled by so she tried running to the street to flag that car down but it kept on going past so she ran to the back of the house and started pounding on the back door begging crying for help. A man answered the door and Mary begged him to call the police. 
which he did. Now, as this was happening to Mary, you know, as all this was going down, Jimmy, meanwhile, had regained consciousness. He immediately remembered what happened, like immediately before like passing out. And he was like thinking like, okay, like, what do I do? How do I get out of this? He did notice that his assailant was now gone and through his impaired vision, because remember his glasses were knocked off somewhere, so he didn't know where. But through his impaired vision, he could see headlights coming down the road and wiping the blood from his eyes. Jimmy managed to crawl his way to the road and he managed to flag down that car driving by. He he would later say that at first, like, he was kind of nervous. He was like, shit, like, what if this car is like the guy that just attacked me? And like, he thought he killed me. And now I just like flagged him down. But his his need and like his desire for like medical attention and like needing help just overrode that. And he was like, I, I got to take a chance. It was a couple in the car. The man was driving. The woman was in the passenger side. And Jimmy begged them, quote, I've got to see a doctor. I'm hurt bad. Take me to the hospital. And as he went to open the back door to get in, the man stopped him and, you know, suddenly told him, quote, don't do that. You'll get blood in my car. And Jimmy later said that, like, he couldn't believe that he was like, he's standing there bleeding, half naked, because remember, his his pants are on the ground somewhere. And like, this fool is worried about like blood on on his seat. I've seen some people be like, well, he could have been like kind of worried for his date too, you know, like like the woman could have been freaked out. I don't know. But yeah, like, I was just like, yeah, of course that honestly, this exchange right here, like really doesn't surprise me. Does it surprise you? Because it honestly doesn't. People just fail to surprise me like this anymore. But yeah, so yeah, this guy is telling Jimmy like, whoa, don't don't be get in my car. You might get blood all over my seat. And the man told Jimmy that they would they would call the police as soon as they stumbled across the telephone. But right at this moment, all right, right at this moment as this exchange was happening, an ambulance was coming down the road because remember, Mary had gotten help. It was blasting its siren like super loud and it was followed by several police cars. So Jimmy immediately was able to get medical attention from them. And then the couple in the car were never seen or heard from again. I think they just kind of like drove off. Now within 30 minutes of this attack, Bowie County Sheriff William Bill Hardy Presley and three other officers arrived at the scene. And when she had heard the ambulance's siren coming down the road, that's when Mary had stepped out of the house to where she had sought refuge. And uh, she was able to get a ride to the hospital with uh, one of the police cars, because I believe the ambulance had left with uh, Jimmy because he was he was hurt bad. We'll, we'll get into it in just a second. Now, according to original articles, Mary was not hospitalized at all and was only described as having minor lacerations. In actuality, she had to have eight stitches to the cut to her scalp. But she didn't have to like stay in the hospital. She got her stitches and then she was released. Jimmy, however, had to be hospitalized for several weeks. He had three skull fractures, was barely conscious when he got to the hospital. He was floating between life and death and he would end up being in a coma for a week. Now, as police worked the crime scene, they managed to track what they believed to be the assailant's vehicle. They were man- they managed to track that with the tire tracks in the dirt. They tracked him to the house where Mary had gotten help, suggesting that she had narrowly avoided him again, that he had followed her. From there, they tracked him eastwards to Summerhill Road, which was another graveled road. They ended up finding Jimmy's trousers about 100 yards from the crime scene. And at the hospital, Sheriff Presley and his deputy, Frank Riley, attempted to interview Mary, but they... It's always hard to discern on if... Because, like, obviously she was going to be in shock, right? But, like, Reports would say that she was too, like, hysterical for them to really interview her, um, which I can kind of get. She was probably, like, in shock and and traumatized, right? But I always kind of, like, look at that when, when it's, like, old articles like that and they call a woman hysterical, you know what I mean? She did her best to recall everything. And when they asked her if they could identify him, she said, like, no, she couldn't, but she knew his voice. Quote, I don't know. I never saw or heard him before. I'd never forget that voice, how mean it was. He had on a white mask. It had cutout places for his eyes and mouth. She said, though she never saw his face, through the, like, eye holes, which of course weren't like cut perfectly to the eye. So like with the, through the, the big eye holes of in the pillowcase that he was wearing and due to his voice, she thought the assailant was a light skinned black man. But seeing that she was like still in a state of shock, I think it was kind of hard to, to get her to really tell like in a chronological order of events, like what happened. So the police decided to like, you know what, let's drive her home, let her calm down. We'll come back later and attempt to re-interview her. And as we mentioned, Jimmy was in a coma, so he couldn't be interviewed yet. Now, as the days passed, 
All right, Jimmy's still in the hospital in his coma. As the days pass, police start questioning Mary's version of events. Now, the police thought due to the locale, like where it took place, and the type of crime, it didn't add up to a black assailant because black criminals tended to hunt within their own ethnic groups. Like I read that in a newspaper article too from back then and I was like, wait, what? Like, what is this? Yeah, so they didn't really believe Mary. Um, they didn't think that it was like a black guy that they were chasing because black people hunt within their own ethnic groups whatever but dude like that's that's what it said and they also thought like the hood was was weird like they figured like well the point of the hood would obviously be to con like conceal the identity right but it, they were already out like in the pitch dark not to mention the assailant had the flashlight and like if the guy was black like all of this would just help in like concealing him so like why 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 wear the hood they also thought it was weird that they that the assailant would choose to wear a white mask on top of that like why wear like something super bright and and noticeable even in like pitch black dark right and they thought Maybe the assailant thought Jimmy and Mary were someone else. One deputy posited that perhaps Mary and or Jimmy knew who the assailant was. And either due to fear or what have you, they decided to, you know, Mary decided to make up that tidbit about the, the, the mask, the pillowcase mask. And as more days passed, this theory right here, all right, that Jimmy and or Mary knew the assailant gained a lot of traction within the police. So they dug into Mary and Jimmy's backgrounds. They thought, well, maybe Mary's ex-husband or Jimmy's ex-wife had something to do with this. Maybe it was some sort of like, you know, jealous, you know, love angle or something. But uh, Mary's ex-husband's alibi checked out. And, you know, all of uh, Mary's family and friends, her ex-husband's family and friends said that like, no, the divorce was amicable. They both wanted it. Like there was no, you know, lingering resentments or anything. And when questioned again, Mary reiterated what she had already told police about the attack. And again, reiterated that though she wouldn't be able to identify his face because she never saw it, she would definitely be able to identify him via his voice. Quote, I'll never forget that voice as long as I live. It rings always in my ears. They dug into Jimmy's past as well. Um, again, wondering if maybe his ex-wife had something to do with it or whatever. But uh, yeah, like with Mary, Jimmy's brothers said that, you know, no, he has no enemies. The divorce was amicable. They both wanted it. And they could think of like no one who would want to do harm to their brother. Now, due to the viciousness of the crime, police thought that this attack had something to do with with like revenge or or getting even or something. And that was really what they believed just due to like the the brutality of it all, you know? But they couldn't find anything in Jimmy or Mary's lives, their their past or anything that could could explain that. But they still could never shake the feeling that there was some sort of jilted lover, revenge, some some sort of angle like that that had to do with these crimes. They never, never shook that feeling. Meanwhile, Jimmy slowly began to recover in the hospital. And as he was like in his coma and like recuperating, the, the night, that night just played over and over in his mind. His family said that as he was in his coma um, and later when he was awake, but sort of like in that like subconscious state of like in between awake and asleep, his body would react as if he was like reliving the event in real time, like the struggle with the assailant and getting attacked and stuff. Um, and it was so bad, he actually had to be restrained to his bed because he would like jerk and twist. And like he even punched one of his brothers in the jaw by accident when he was going through one of these like events. After just over two weeks in the hospital, Jimmy was okay enough to be released at home and recuperate at home. And that is when he would talk to investigators for the first time. He said he did not know who the attacker was, neither did Mary, and that the whole thing seemed to just happen out of the blue, happen completely randomly. The only thing he could really describe was the man's behavior, describing him as tall, mean, and angry. He said that the man's words just dripped with hostility. And he characterized the assailant, quote, I think he is a young white man, not over 30 years old, and he's desperate. That man's dangerous. He's a potential murderer. The next one he gets a hold of will be killed. Evidently, he thought he killed me that night. I know he was crazy. The crazy things he said, I know his mind was warped. Interestingly enough, Jimmy said he himself did not see the assailant wearing like a hood or a mask, but he was willing to accept what Mary said as, as truth because, you know, he was blinded by the flashlight in his eyes and then he got like 
whacked in the head really quick. So he was like, I, I, if she says that he was wearing a, you know, pillowcase with, with eye hole cut out, I'm going to go ahead and believe her. I didn't see that because I was blinded by the flashlight and then, you know, whacked in the head. But if she says that's what she saw, that's what she saw. And with a little bit of conflicting accounts from their two victims, primarily regarding the, the pillowcase with the eye holes cut out of it. It is said police were frustrated working this case from the beginning. They were left with one victim saying like, oh, I thought it was a black guy, with another one saying like, nah, I think it was a young white dude. One saying that like, oh no, he wore a mask. The other one saying like, I didn't see that. And yeah, it was it was as they were working this, they, ju- they were like, either Jimmy and or Mary know who the assailant is. And they thought, particularly Mary, like they thought maybe one or both of them, but they really had their sights on Mary. And they thought that one or both of them did know the identity of the gunman and for whatever reason was protecting him. And they really thought that like her making up this black guy wearing a mask was like, yeah, them trying to protect this guy for whatever reason. Like they truly believed that. And as March began, police still had no suspects and still believed that Mary and or Jimmy were not telling everything they knew. One afternoon on Wednesday, March 20th, a Texas Ranger visited Jimmy. His name was Stuart Stanley, and he interviewed Jimmy at his home, asking again if he was sure he did not know the identity of the gunman. Quote, who would try to do this kind of thing to you? Which of your enemies would do it? And Jimmy insisted, like, I don't have any enemies, bro. Like, what are you talking about? And when Stanley asked Jimmy if he wasn't sure sure you're not covering for someone, Jimmy? Are you sure? Jimmy apparently lost it. He was so frustrated. He said, quote, are you kidding? After what I've gone through, if it was my grandmother, I'd want to see her hang. I'm trying to tell you that this man is brutal. He's a potential killer. If you don't find him, the next thing you know, he's going to kill someone. Now, both Jimmy and Mary would suffer some pretty bad PTSD and trauma from this event. Uh, yeah. In fact, Mary was so fearful and scared, she actually moved with an aunt and uncle to Frederick, Oklahoma. And it is said she really wanted to get out of the area because she really thought that the assailant was going to come back and kill her. She was super, super fearful. And it is said even there on her aunt and uncle's farm, like super far away, she was still really anxious. Um, she didn't like being alone. She wouldn't go upstairs alone. And Jimmy too, yeah, suffered, suffered some trauma too. And he had not just psychological scars, he had physical ones from the attack too. Most of them were covered by his hairline, but there was a very noticeable one that couldn't be covered by his hairline. It was on the left side of his forehead and it like went into his hairline. And like with Mary, he too felt uncomfortable in Texarkana and he ended up moving to Shreveport, Louisiana, which was about 75 miles away to the south. And he said, quote, you can't forget a thing like that. Last night in Shreveport, I was riding in a car with a friend. We stopped to wait on a red traffic light. A friend came running up and jumped up on the running board and I began shaking. And police were just really stumped with this case. They thought so many things were weird about this crime. Like the fact that he didn't really gain a whole lot of money with this. He had sexually attacked Mary, but hadn't like assaulted her like himself. So they were like, like, was he impotent? Is he just sadistic? And they, they still weren't sure. Like, was this a crime? Like revenge, jealousy, could it have been mistaken identity? And they were really left flummoxed. They had no answers. And as far as the public reporting on this attack went, um, there were some initial articles that talked about it. Uh, most of the headlines in the newspapers were reserved for like prominent townspeople returning from the war and stuff like that. But there were a few articles. And like at this time, it is said, all right, in 1946, at this time in Texarkana, it wasn't like the most dangerous place to be. It was It was thought that like it was relatively safe as long as you kept your head down, kept to your own business, kept good company and stayed out of trouble and stuff like that. You could live a relatively safe, comfortable life in Texarkana. You know what I mean? So this attack on Jimmy and Mary didn't really instill a lot of fear amongst people. You know what I mean? Like everyone thought like, oh, it's probably some like lover spat or there was, it was like someone they knew. You know what I mean? Like there was a, an explainable way to answer why this crime happened. You know what I mean? So that didn't really produce a lot of fear in people. 
and yeah, like I said, like, yeah, it was pretty much like, yeah, just, just keep with good people, stick to your, like, your own business and you'll be fine. But like, yeah, I mean, people still kept their doors unlocked, windows opened, children played well past sundown, and there wasn't really, like, a lot of fear. So let's talk about Richard Lanier Griffin, who was 29 years old. He was the oldest of five, and he hailed from Cass County, Texas. He worked as a carpenter and a cabinet maker, and he worked for a contractor. And actually, after Pearl Harbor, Richard and his contractor contractor he worked for actually went to Hawaii to work on some of the damaged ships there. And when Richard returned from Hawaii, that is when he joined the Navy. Now, due to his prior work experience, he served in the Navy's Construction Battalion, or Seabees as they're called, in the South Pacific during World War II. And as he was serving in the Pacific, building bases and landing strips for, like, Marines as they uh, gained ground against the Japanese, Richard's father passed away and he was unable to attend the funeral. And in November of 1945, Richard was discharged from the Seabees. And he ended up living with his mother, Bernice Griffin, and a sister named Eleanor in Robertson Courts, which was on the western edge of Texarkana. His brother, David, also lived here, and the two of them looked for work after returning home from the war. Richard returned to carpentry, of course, and it said he actually spent most of his time in Cass County working on some sort of, like, personal project. And since Cass County was about 40 miles from Texarkana, Arcana. He only went there on the weekends to like visit his family and like get some rest. And in February of 1946, 29-year-old Richard Griffin met and started dating 17-year-old Polly Ann Moore. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you catch that age gap? 29, 17. Not a fan, not a fan. But again. I digress. Polly also hailed from Cass County. She had a younger brother named Mark, and her and her brother were primarily raised by their mother, Lizzie, after their father, George, had passed away. Polly was about eight years old when her father died. Polly attended Atlanta, Texas High School, and in May of 1945, when she was only 16 years old, she graduated with her diploma. Polly worked at the Red River Ordnance Depot, and here she was a checker of ammunition and other material that was being loaded out, and she helped maintain like their inventory record records and stuff. Her mother and brother lived in Cornet, Texas, and since they didn't have a car, Polly had to find a way to work. But her mother's cousin, Ardella Campbell, lived in Texarkana and had an extra room to rent out. So that is where Polly primarily lived, and about once a month or so, she would take the bus to go see her mother and brother, or vice versa. And on Saturday evening, March 23rd, 1946, Richard had driven to Texarkana to pick Polly up. They were going to go on a dinner and a movie date. Polly's friends said her and Richard had been going together for about six weeks at this point in time. The plan was to go eat at the Canary Cottage, a very popular restaurant, and then go to a movie. They met up with Richard's sister, Eleanor, and her boyfriend, Jesse A. Proctor, and they had dinner together, and afterwards, the couples went their separate ways. Polly had actually spilled something on her blouse during dinner, so Richard had driven her home so she could change before the movie. They then headed to the midnight showing at the Paramount Theater. They saw a film called Snafu which was a 1945 co uh, comedy out of Columbia. And after the movie, the couple headed for a late night snack at the West 7th Cafe. There was a lot of like 24 hour like places in this town because there was just a lot of you know, industry and stuff at this town, in this town at this time. So having a snack at like a, a cafe that was open super late was not terribly uncommon. And they left the cafe around 2 a.m. Now headed for Polly's home, Richard drove out on U.S. Highway 67 West in Texas, which was a major road that connected Dallas, Texas with Little Rock, Arkansas. And it was less than half a mile past the Texarkana Arcana, Tex Arcana city limits near the Stockman's Cafe. And here he turned south and then drove about 50 to 100 yards off the highway. And there he stopped at a parking area and it was in a low spa that was like blanketed and covered by a bunch of like willows and trees and brush and stuff. And across the road was a gravel pit that had like its gate locked. And due to like the, the privacy and the seclusion of this area, like with all the trees and stuff, it was also, again, a pretty popular makeout spot. And uh, Richard then killed the engine. And a short time later, not quite sure how long Richard and Polly had been there, but a short time later, another car had pulled up. 
and the couple probably assumed it was another couple there to park. But as Richard and Polly were continuing their conversation, suddenly a dark, shadowy figure emerged out of nowhere, brandishing a gun. With the gun pointed at them, the figure demanded Richard to drop his pants, which he did, and they fell to his ankles. Now, according to the book I read, no one knows exactly what happened after this, but what we do know is that the gunman eventually shot Richard twice in the back of the head inside his car, after having him lower his trousers to limit his movement. And I was confused on if he made Richard like take off his trousers inside the car or what. I was a little confused on that. And we also know that the gunman shot Polly too. Only she was shot outside the car on a blanket, leaving a blood-soaked patch of dirt about 20 feet away from the vehicle. And the killer then placed Polly's body back inside the car. And that is what we know for for sure happened, is that they were they were killed. And on Sunday morning, March 24th, Richard and Polly's bodies would be found in Richard's Oldsmobile car. And they would be found by a passing motorist around 9 a.m. that Sunday. And the, uh, the motorist who saw them, of course, then alerted authorities who then descended onto the scene and... <sighs> Not necessarily a good thing. We'll we'll get into it. So when the passing motorist had first come upon Richard and Polly, the way they were positioned, he thought maybe they were like asleep. It wasn't too uncommon, right? To have like a long road trip and you just kind of like people would like pull over and just kind of sleep in their vehicle, take a nap or something. And that's what the, the person who discovered their bodies thought. He thought that they were asleep for a second. Richard was in between the front seats, leaning forward from the back seat on his knees, and his head was face down, resting on his hands, which were crossed. His pockets had been turned inside out and his trousers were around his ankles. Now, news articles said that Polly was found lying sprawled in the back seat face down, but the book I read said that she was actually in a seated slumped position in the front passenger seat. She was fully clothed. Richard had been shot twice, as we said, and both he and Polly had been shot in the back of the head. Congealed blood was found splattered along the car's running board and along the bottom of the car door, and there was blood splattered everywhere in the interior. A 32 caliber shell casing was found, which news articles said was possibly ejected from a pistol wrapped in a blanket. And it was believed that the couple had been killed sometime around or before midnight. Now, neither Richard nor Polly's bodies were examined by a pathologist. And I guess there are disputes on whether or not Polly was sexually assaulted. Um, but the book I read said that she had a, uh, like a, I think like a pad or a tampon or something still like, like on her, like in her, whatever. And that's what led the physicians to declare like, oh, she wasn't sexually attacked because that was still there. And to make matters worse, there was some light rain that evening and it had washed away any footprints the killer left behind in the dirt and stuff. Now, when Sheriff Presley arrived on scene, there was already a crowd gathered. Yeah, which is not good, right? No police line had been set up. People were able to just walk right up to the car and peer in at the bodies. And it said it was like a major, major chore to take control of the scene. I mean, the scene's already damaged at this point. And uh, as we'll get into it, that'll that's one of the reasons this case is still cold. It's just, you know, it just proceeds procedures were not like they were today, right? And since it was a small area in a relatively like isolated location, there was numerous cars, like police cars, rubberneckers, and like all kinds of chaos at the scene, it didn't take long for reporters to also descend into the chaos. One reporter asked Sheriff Presley if this was a murder-suicide, and he said, quote, no, definitely not. Both were shot in the back of their heads. It's a double murder. We're still looking for clues and leads. We found no weapon. Richard was identified through his ID, which which was in his pocket in his wallet, and Polly would be identified via her class ring that she wore. Polly's funeral would be held that following Monday, March 25th, at the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, which was in the small community of Brian's Mill, and she would ultimately be buried in a cemetery not far from where she had been born. Richard's funeral, meanwhile, was held the following day on Tuesday, March 26th, and it was held at the Union Chapel Church near where the family lived in Robertson Court, and he was ultimately buried in Cass County, Texas. Now, after this uh, double murder, Presley notified both the Texas and Arkansas side officials at the city, county, and state levels, as well as the FBI and the Texas Department of Public Safety, which was the agency that oversaw the Texas Rangers. And they promised to have a ranger dispatched immediately. And going back to the crime scene, like we said, um, not only did they have, you know, 
looky loos and other officers and everyone just trampling over everything. The light rain just washed away any usable footprints or anything. By the end of the day, the only thing the police knew for certain was that there had been a double murder. Richard's car was eventually moved to the uh, Arkansas side police station in Texarkana, and they were going to dust it for fingerprints, all right? And, uh... Yeah, when they got it off the tow truck, they used their ungloved hands to push it into a spot where they could get fingerprints. Yeah, like I said, the procedures were just not what they were today. Richard's keys had not been in the car when it was discovered, and his keys were actually found um, in the the crime scene by a uh, a looky-loo who had found them like in like some brush or something. And all in all, there was just not a lot of evidence to go on. Texas Rangers Jim Greer of Clarksville and Dick Ray Oldham of Palestine would end up heading the investigation into Richard and Polly's murders. And one of Richard's brothers, Wellborn Griffin, was actually at the police station when Texas Ranger Greer first showed up into town because he showed up first and then Oldham would show up later. But he was there, all right, when when Texas Ranger Greer first showed up in town. And he was talking about how, like, a bunch of officers just flocked to him. And, like, it reminded him of, like, a bunch of school children going up to, like, the teacher. And they all, like, yeah, were talking at the same time, but barding him with questions and stuff. He said Greer then stood on a chair and shouted for them to all shut the hell up. And then Wellborn said, quote, And the first question he asked him was, When y'all found the car and the bodies, did y'all rope that area off and secure it until you could make a thorough investigation? And, of course, they told him no. And then Wellborn continued, quote, And I'll tell you the exact words he said. Told him, well, if you didn't do that, you destroyed all the goddamn evidence there was. That's just the words he told him right there. And it said Greer set to work to try to salvage what he could. They hadn't even removed the bullets from Polly's body, guys. Like, she was buried with the bullets still inside of her. Greer did manage to hold on to Richard's body, though. And he was able to get the bullets from, from his body. Now, over 200 people would end up being questioned and interviewed throughout the course of this investigation. And the only clues police really had were the bullets extracted from Richard and maybe some fingerprints from his car. So the bullets extracted from Richard did tell them that the murder weapon was a 32 caliber weapon and most likely it was an automatic Colt pistol. Or if it wasn't a, an automatic Colt, it was some sort of foreign make since there was a bunch of people coming back from World War II. There were a lot of foreign models out there, but they were saying like Colts are super common. So if it's not like an automatic Colt, it's one of these foreign makes. And other than that, there was nothing really for them to go on. And it is said, even though uh, Texarkana had two of everything, the thing that police on both sides really lacked was manpower. And this story was reported at first, like it was gruesome, all right? It was like a double murder. So, you know, it, it was gruesome and it caught people's attention. But it was one of those cases that just grew larger as each day passed. Mary heard of the incident all the way in Oklahoma and she actually decided to come back to Texarkana to, again, see if she could get the police to listen to her. The more details she read about the attack on uh, Richard and Polly, the more she believed that the guy who had attacked her and Jimmy had escalated to murder, and it was the same guy. She hoped by telling officers, which now included, like, Texas Rangers, that, you know, she could provide them with something and they could, you know, catch this guy. But once again, police hammered Mary with questions. They, again thought that she knew the identity of the assailant who attacked her and Jimmy. And it is said that she left Texarkana with just everything she's saying falling on deaf ears. And as far as like the public reaction to the story, again, like, you know, it was a big story, you know, because it was gruesome. It was a double murder. But again, it wasn't, it it didn't set fear in, in people, you know, it was thought like, oh, Richard or Polly, you know, some sort of grudge, right? Like they had something in their past that explained why this happened to them. And at this time, most residents had completely forgotten about the attack on Mary and Jimmy. So it's not like, you know, they didn't, you know, like like put these two cases together or anything like that. So there wasn't a whole lot of like, you know, public hysteria or anything like that. By March 30th, with no other leads or clues to go on, Sheriff Presley announced a $500 reward for anyone who came forward with information that led to an arrest. 
But unfortunately, this just produced over a hundred fake leads and it provided them with no suspects or information at all. And it was around this time when the reward was offered and they didn't have anything that Oldham was dispatched to join Greer, which I guess was like a big deal at the time. I guess there was like this old saying, one riot, one ranger, indicating that like, you know, like the Texas Rangers are like so elite so good at their job. You just need one ranger to like solve everything, you know? And so when they have Oldham dispatch a Texarkana to assist Greer, it was seen as like kind of like a big deal. Like, oh damn, they've got like two rangers working on this. But yeah, this double murder just had everyone stumped. They're just completely stumped. No one knew how to explain it. So even though the the case of, of Richard and Polly definitely made the rounds, people were aware of it, it didn't produce any mass fear. You know, once again, it was thought like, oh, something in their past, someone wanted to like get even or something. So let's go to Friday, April 12th, 1946. James Paul Martin, who was 17, borrowed his brother's Ford coupe car after school to drive the approximately 100 miles to Texarkana. He was primarily driving there to see Betty Jones. Joe Booker, who was 15, and whom he had known for like 10 years, like practically his whole life. They had both attended Texarkana Elementary Schools on the Arkansas side together. James went by his middle name, Paul, and his father, Reuben S. Martin, had opened an ice business in Smackover, Arkansas, which was like a small oil boom town. And this is where Paul would be born. When an even bigger boom happened in the early 1930s, Paul's father moved his business to Kilgore. And his wife, Paul's mother, Inez Martin, chose Texarkana's Arkansas side to settle the family. And this included Paul and his three older brothers, Reuben Martin Jr., Q, and Jack. They all attended Texarkana schools, and friends described Paul as, quote, a short boy with the best attitude you ever saw. I don't think he had an enemy in the world. Everybody loved him, and he just loved people. When Paul was just 11 years old, his father unfortunately died. And World War II then picked up not long after that, so Paul's older brothers all served. But Paul was too young. And since he was too young, it is said he completed up to the ninth grade at Arkansas Junior High School in Texarkana before he left and attended the Gulf Coast Military Academy, which was located in Gulfport, Mississippi. And he would attend here, this military academy, for about a year. And then he returned to Kilgore after that and attended the high school there and also worked part-time at the family's uh, ice business plant, the plant that they had there. And in the coming summer of 1946... He was slated to be the plant's next night engineer and was scheduled to graduate school the following year, 1947. So like we said, Paul had plans that weekend of April 12th, 1946. And that was to uh, drive to Texarkana and see Betty, who lived in the city Sussex Downs on the Texas side. She lived with her mother, Bessie Booker, and her stepfather, Clark Brown. Betty's biological father, William Blatton Boogie, or Tuggy Booker, had actually died in a car accident in Louisiana when Betty was about three years old, so she never really got to know her father. And Clark, her stepfather, was the one who primarily raised her. She also had an older brother named Billy, who did have some sort of mental disability. I know de- um, mentally he never ever developed past childhood, and he would actually end up um, passing away at the age of 16 in an institution. Betty was around 12. Now, when her father had died, he had been the county treasurer of Moore County, Arkansas, and Betty's mother was the one who was selected to finish out his term. And then she would go on to be elected for several more terms. And it is said Betty enjoyed a very close relationship with both her parents. She was very close with her mother and close with her stepfather. He was the father that she never got to know. And it is said that they would often sing together while doing dishes. Clark would teach her a bunch of old cowboy songs. Now, Betty was a popular high school sophomore, and the reports state that she was a junior at this time. But either way, she was a popular high school student, a Delta Beta Sigma sorority member. She played in the school band, of which she was an officer. She had won scholastic, literary, and music awards, had started dancing at an early age, often dancing in civic club programs, and at church. And she had been a former Little Miss Tex Arcana in 1934. She had even sung all four verses of Silent Night, Holy Night at her church. So she was a very, very talented, very busy young woman. And when she entered high school, she actually started playing the saxophone and diving more into singing. And in fact, she was so good at the saxophone, she actually managed to get a part-time job. It was in a local orchestra, Jerry Atkins and his Rhythmaries. 
Rhythmares, I think that's how you say that. But they would perform at like club events and, you know, other stuff like that. Now, when Paul drove to Texarkana that Friday, April 12th, Betty was unaware of just how much of his plans revolved around her. So on Saturday morning, April 13th, Paul phoned Betty up and told her he would be by in the afternoon. He said that there was a a slumber party that night that they could swing by and like, yeah, they could just like hang out. Paul was staying at a good friend's house, Tom Albritton. That's where he had stayed the night. And Paul also had planned to take Betty to the midnight movie along with Tom and his date. But he hadn't divulged that part of the plan to Betty yet. Now, Paul spent that Saturday morning getting ready, washing his brother's car and hanging out with Tom. Meanwhile, the weather was so nice that Saturday, Betty changed her plans and decided to go swimming with a good friend. Her name was Sophie Ann White, and she was studying music at the University of Texas in Austin. And the two girls were really close. Sophie's mom had taught Betty how to play the piano. And whenever she was in town, Sophie would play in the Jerry Atkins band with Betty. So they were good friends and she was in town. So yeah, Betty decided, you know what? The weather's so nice. Sophie's in town. We're going to we're gonna go swimming. And so that's what they did. And while the two girls were gone swimming, Paul stopped by Betty's house. And of course, Betty's parents told him where she was at. And, you know, he's like, oh, that's fine or whatever. And he stopped by their house for about an hour and talked to them. Because again, he had known the bookers like pretty much his whole life. And when he left, he's like, hey, just tell Betty I'll call her later on that evening. And that's exactly what he did. Paul told Betty that he would pick her up after her band performance that night at the VFW Club, which was at West 4th and Oak Street in Texarkana. And Paul was like, hey, I'll, I'll pick you up after your performance tonight. And, you know, Betty decided like, okay, that was fine. Even though she had expected another boy named Jimmy Morris to pick her up. They had like, They were like kind of dating, kind of, sort of, not really. But that's who she'd expected to pick her up. But like she called up um, him and was like, hey, my good friend Paul's in town. Like, can he pick me up and we can like, can we like delay our plans? And like, yeah, Jim was like, that's fine. So while Betty would be performing at the VFW club, Paul and Tom spent the evening with some friends, you know, just hanging out, you know chatting and whatnot around town. Tom had a date later that night with a girl named Ramona Putnam, or excuse me, Putman. And the plan was for them to do a double date at that midnight movie that Paul wanted to date Betty to. And the plan was for Paul to depart them, go pick up Betty, and then come back, pick them up, and they'd go to the movie. Meanwhile, Betty and her orchestra started performing at the club at around 9 p.m. And they'd end up playing about four hours with breaks. So Paul, Tom, and Ramona, meanwhile, hung out as the night progressed. They went to a movie, ate a snack at a cafe, and planned to see the midnight showing at the Paramount with Betty in tow. So Paul left them, of course, early to go pick up Betty, not realizing that she wouldn't be able to make the the midnight movie. Now, after Paul left them, Ramona called her mom to make sure it was okay for her to go see the midnight showing with Tom, but her mom said no. So at 1130, with Paul still not showing back up, Tom decided to walk Ramona back home. And then he decided to to go to bed. It was late. He figured Betty wasn't going to be able to go to the movie, and he was like, eh, I'll just turn in. Paul, meanwhile, had waited for Betty out in his car outside the VFW club, and she finally emerged around 1.30 a.m. So technically Sunday, April 14th. Now, normally, the first thing Betty did after a gig, if she was going to, like, go back out and not go straight home, was she would drop off her very expensive saxophone off at home. And that was the plan before Paul suggested they take a shortcut through Spring Lake Park. It was only a few minutes away from Betty's home, about two miles outside the city limits. And he thought they could like detour here and then drop her instrument off at home. And Betty agreed. And then afterwards, I think they were going to swing by the slumber party that was happening. Newspaper articles said that the two had stopped by an all-night cafe to get a snack and they were last seen around 2 a.m. So Paul drove to Spring Lake Park, all right, which was like this large tree-filled, like beautiful park, had lots of, you know, trees and woodsy areas, lots of winding paths and stuff like that. And it said that they, they could seem more like labyrinths if you weren't from the area and you didn't really know the area that well. And due to, you know, all of all of the trees, which provided lots of privacy and bushes and stuff and all the winding paths, it was a popular makeout spot, both in the daytime and evening time, because like the, the trees and stuff just offered a lot of privacy. Meanwhile, that early Sunday morning, Betty's mother, Bessie, was waiting up for her daughter. This was something she usually did, and she'd wait for her daughter to come home, and then she would, you know, excitedly recount the the, the event and the performance and how it went. But uh, eventually, you know, as, as Saturday night started ending and Sunday morning started beginning, Bessie was like, you know what, why am I staying up so late? Like... She's going to be home late. She can, I'll talk to her in the morning. I'm going to go to bed. And so that's what she did. And a short time later, Bessie
Jessie awoke. And she walked to the front room and realized that, like, okay, her daughter wasn't home. But what really alarmed her was the fact that Betty's saxophone wasn't there. Remember, we said earlier, even if she was going to go out and do something after her performance, the first thing Betty did was drop off her expensive saxophone at home. So when Bessie awoke and Betty wasn't home and neither was her saxophone, she became a little worried. And after calling some friends and fellow bandmates, the only thing Bessie learned was that Betty had left the performance with Paul. And then several hours later, around 5.30 a.m. that Sunday morning, farmer Tom Moores was busy getting ready for the day. And, you know, he's doing his thing when all of a sudden he heard a gunshot which normally he probably wouldn't even notice, but it was so early in the morning, like who on earth would be firing guns this early? And then at around 6 a.m. that same Sunday morning, Paul's body would be found. It was on the edge of a thicket-lined country road. This road was called North Park Road, and he was found by Mr. and Mrs. G. H. Weaver and their son. So they lived in the nearby area, and they were actually on their way to Prescott, Arkansas to visit some family for the day. And they were taking North Park Road road to get there. And that's when they came across Paul's body. They saw his form lying on the edge of the road. And as they got closer, they could clearly see it was a human body. Paul was lying against a hedge of honeysuckle on his left side by the northern edge of the road. His head and the trunk of his body lay on the leaves and grass on the side of the road, while his feet and legs sprawled out into the actual road. Now, Mr. Weaver did not get out of his vehicle to inspect Paul's body. Instead, he kept driving. He drove about 200 yards further further down the road until he came upon a house. And when he saw that house, that's when he stopped and asked them to call the police. Now, when the homeowners phoned police, Sheriff Presley and longtime friend, Texarkana Chief of Police on the Texas side, Jackson, Jack, Neely, Reynolds were having breakfast together when the call came in. So they were the two that got the call and they were the first two officers on scene. And since it was these two first on scene, there was a lot more control on this crime scene. Blood was found on the other side of the road by the fence, leading them to believe that Paul had been shot on that side of the road and had crawled to where he was found. Paul was identified by his ID, which was in his wallet, in his pocket, and he had been shot four times. Once through the ribs from behind, once under his shoulder from behind, he was shot in the right hand and shot through the back of his neck with the bullet exiting through the front of his skull. After more officers arrived on scene, Presley then began like taking stock of the scene and what he could find. He found Paul's date book on the ground near some bushes and they also found Paul's car, which was about a mile away. It was parked outside Spring Lake Park on a road that ran outside of it and the keys were still in the ignition. And not that they knew it at the time, but Betty's saxophone was also missing from the car. Now, 13-year-old Bill Horner lived nearby where they found Paul's car. And that Sunday morning, his mom had sent him to the store to pick up a loaf of bread. And so as he's walking to the store, he sees like all the police cars and the commotion. And when he goes inside, the clerk tells him about like the murder. And so, you know, his curiosity piqued, he decided to, you know, go walk over and see what he could find. Now, when he first came upon the scene where Paul's car was found, there were three men standing there. They were standing to his right, and then he saw Paul's Ford Coupe parked mostly off the road, but part of it was like still on it. It was facing south towards town. Now, the three men were officers, with two of them being Presley and Runnels. Now, they didn't really notice Bill's presence, and uh, the young, young teenager decided to eavesdrop on their conversation and see what the lawmen were discussing. So one of the men left, leaving Presley and Runnels. And Bill then heard one of them say, quote, I can't figure out why there's no tracks coming out. And Bill's eyes followed to what they were talking about. And he saw that the men were talking about some footprints that were left in the dirt. There were two sets of tracks. There was larger footprints, which indicated they belonged to a male, and a smaller set, which indicated they belonged to a female. The tracks started from the road and went over like the dirt, leaves, and brush, and pine needles and stuff. No more than 30 feet from the road. But that was it. There were no tracks like going further and there were no tracks leading back to the road and that's what they were discussing and it looked as if like yeah the the owner of the of the footprints just like up and vanished and either Presley or Runnels then just said quote they got out here indicating the road and they went over there and where did they go from there and the two officers left then leaving Bill pretty much unnoticed and that's what he had overheard them discussing now at first of course right police had no idea that like 
Betty was missing, possibly dead. Like, they had no idea. But as word started to spread of Paul's murder, their friends, like their their mutual friends, Betty's friends, knew, who knew that she left uh, with Paul from the dance, the, uh, her bandmates as well, they began making calls to each other to see, like, if anyone had spoken to her. And it didn't take long for authorities to then be notified that Betty was last seen in the company of Paul. And so a search party was then formed to try and find what they presumed to be her body unless she had been kidnapped and was somehow still alive. So several search parties were formed by uh, law enforcement officials and family and friends of Betty and other townspeople. They started, of course, um, where Paul was found and where his vehicle was, and then just kind of spread out from there, looking for any sign of her. Tom, meanwhile, woke up to police officers at his door, since he was the one that Paul had been staying with. Police, of course, wanted to talk to him. He was, of course, shocked and horrified at his friend's death. And when they asked him, like, why would Paul and Betty go to Spring Lake Park, he told them, like, well, it's a popular makeout area for, like, the young people. And Betty's body would be found a few hours later by members of the search party, specifically by family friends. They were James and George Boyd, Ted Shropey, and James's two sons, James Jr. and Jack. George was the one who actually found Betty's body. It was around 11.30 a.m., around noon, like somewhere around there. She was about a mile west from Paul's body, and she was behind a tree in a thicket, lying on her back, fully clothed. She was posed with her right hand in her buttoned-up coat pocket, and she had been shot twice once through the heart and once in the face, with the bullet entering her left cheek near her nose. And from the bullet wounds, they were able to determine that the shots came from the same type of weapon that had killed Richard and Polly, a 32 automatic Colt pistol. And from the trajectory on Betty's wounds, they could tell that the gunman was right-handed and had faced her when he shot her. Unlike with Paul, Richard, and Polly, who had all been shot from behind. Now, apparently there were questions on whether or not Betty was sexually assaulted. Since she was fully clothed and the coat was, like, fully buttoned up, it was, of course, assumed at first that, like, she hadn't been sexually attacked. However, there were some things that made police question this. Firstly, there was a leaf found between her coat and her blouse, indicating that she had took, taken off her coat at some point in time outside. I don't know, like, because, like, sometimes you just pick up debris when you're outside. So, I don't know, maybe she walked by, a, like, a, a tree or something and the leaf got stuck there. I don't know, but... That was just something that they noted that kind of made them question if she had been sexually assaulted. And after her body was examined, it was noted that her vagina did display bruising, but many thought it could have been from like a hand grip, maybe even like a pistol or something. Like it didn't necessarily mean like she had been like, like assaulted. When FBI lab test results came back on April 20th, it found that her vaginal passage did test positive for male se seminal secretion or maybe it's seminal secretion, and there were no foreign hairs amongst her pubic hairs, although her pubic hairs did contain semen. I know they did some sort of, like, saline solution on Paul's genitals, and they were able, like, through that to rule out that Paul and Betty had had sex that night. And so I think that's what led them to question if Betty was indeed sexually assaulted. They also found three latent fingerprints at the scene that they could not explain, one of which was on the steering wheel of Paul's vehicle, and it didn't match Paul, didn't match Betty, and it didn't match anyone in the Martin family. Now, after news of these murders spread, and they spread like wildfire, we're about to get into it, and since it happened so close to where Bessie and Clark, her parents, lived, there were many who told Bessie that she should move away. But she said, quote, we don't intend to move. People tell me to go away. Get out of town. Get away from it all. We can't run away from a thing like this. I trust the men who are handling the investigation of my daughter's death. I'm sure they'll find whoever did it. If he is caught, I would like to kill him. She was, of course, distraught and said that her daughter's death was a, quote, a warning to other parents who let their children roam too free. I don't understand all these things. All I know is that my daughter was an innocent victim, an innocent victim of a madman. Now, almost from the discovery of, of these murders, Presley noted the similarities between Paul and Betty's murders and Richard and Polly's. But he also noted, like, there were some pretty stark differences. Like, for example, Richard and Polly were at least somewhat concealed. They were posed inside the car, so the, it was going to be a while before they were discovered, right, to peer inside a vehicle. Whereas with Paul and Betty, they were just kind of thrown there, you know, like there was really no effort to really hide them or conceal them. So Presley, Reynolds, and another Texas Ranger would end up heading the investigation. This Texas Ranger was Captain Manuel Trezazas. 
I hope that's how you say that. Lone Wolf Gonzalez. I'm going to assume it's Gonzalez. Um, it's spelled G-O-N-Z-A-U-L-L-A-S. And all the pronunciations said that it was like a variation of, of Gonzalez. So I guess that's how I'll pronounce it. But Gonzalez and Presley would end up being sort of the, the li- liaison between the police and the public. They were the ones that would primarily speak to the press and stuff like that. Gonzalez swooped into town that Sunday night, bringing six rangers with him. And apparently he was already a pretty like infamous legendary law enforcement official before this, along with like the big charismatic personality to go with it, you know. He was actually the first person of Spanish descent to ascend to the rank of captain in the Texas Rangers. So that same Sunday evening, as friends and family gathered at the Booker household and, you know, started like reminiscing and just sort of, you know, comforting each other, members of Betty's band realized that they were the last ones to see Betty and Paul alive. And so that's when they decided to go down to the police station and just let them know anything that they knew. They were questioned by Presley and Gonzalez, but the only useful information that was gleaned from this was the fact that Betty's saxophone was missing. She had loaded it into Paul's car. Someone saw her. And since they hadn't found uh, the, the saxophone at all, this was an important clue. So the serial number, make, and model of the saxophone that Betty owned was then disseminated amongst all the music shops and pawn shops within a very large radius, like even in other states. Now, authorities were unable to determine who had been shot first, Betty or Paul, but Gonzalez and Presley did tell the public that due to like lacerations and bruises on their bodies, it was evident that Paul and Betty had put up an intense fight. They did keep quiet um, on the information about like the the type of casings they found on on the murder weapon and on the possibility or likelihood of Betty being sexually assaulted. Those things they kind of kept to themselves. So the night of the discoveries that Sunday night, a number of suspects would end up being brought in and questioned, all right? Like, anyone and everyone was a suspect, especially if you were an out-of-towner. A vigil of about 500 people would end up being gathered outside the Bowie County Sheriff's Office. And that's because when news of these murders spread, it was more shocking and fearful to the public. Not only did you have four murders in three weeks, with no obvious explanation like a grudge or something like that, three of the victims were young teens. You see, it was Paul's and Betty's murder that reminded people of like, oh shit, remember that other double murder from three weeks ago? Richard and Polly? Oh my god. Very quickly, the public kind of linked these two events together. And the fear started started emerging. Another thing that helped really this case spread and like the fear spread was the fact that Betty and Paul had come from pretty prominent local families. Both of their families were pretty well known. Both of them were very well liked. Like there was so much information on Paul and Betty's like murders and like their case. They were pretty well known in the local area. So that helped spread the story And that also made people, like we said, link Richard and Polly's murder with this latest one. And in fact, Betty and Paul were so well-liked and well-known that when their uh, funerals were held the following Tuesday, April 16th, the high school classes actually ended early so students could attend their funerals. They were held at the Beach Street Baptist Church where over a thousand people would end up showing up to pay their last respects to Betty and Paul. So the night... After the murders on Monday night, a $700 reward was collected by the residents of Texarkana for any information that led to an arrest, a conviction, something. And by the time Paul and Betty's funerals were held the next day, the the reward had jumped to $1,450 and then to $2,200. And then the $500 reward in Richard and Polly's uh, case was still being offered as well. Now, at first, even though the public had quickly linked to Richard and Polly and Paul and Betty's murders together, Gonzalez Presley and the rest of the police tried to not really comment on that. So they, they tried not to play into this into those fears or whatever, um, probably again worried about like kicking up mass hysteria, but they would eventually have to concede that yeah, we think they're connected. Police officers within a hundred mile radius followed up on any tips and leads in the case, and many many people would be questioned. Young and old, rich and poor, black and white, it didn't matter. So many people would be questioned. Police questioned that farmer, Tom Moores, who told them about the gunshots he had heard early that Sunday morning. However, Mrs. L.L. 
Charles Swint, who lived about 200 yards away from where Bo Betty's body was found, told police that she had heard nothing at all that Sunday morning or Saturday evening, and she didn't even know anything had happened until she saw a hearse coming to collect Betty's body. Now, there would be another man who would eventually come forward with some information, and he would be described as, quote, the only living witness found to date. This man's name was 45-year-old Ernest Browning, and he lived at an intersection of a side road and Summerhill Road. And he said that Sunday morning, around 6 a.m., he spotted an old model vehicle coming out of the lane after he had heard a few gunshots. And this had been followed by a car starting up, so he assumed that was the car he had heard. He said he saw the car drive to Summerhill Road for about 100 yards, and then it turned south toward Newtown, which was a black section of Texarkana. Ernest said he saw a man driving the car, but that was all he could tell, that it was a man driving the car. He couldn't tell anything else because it was so dark, you know? It's not like there were street lights out there. And he also, due to the darkness, wasn't able to get any type of license plate information either. But that was like the only living witness that police could find. Now, after this latest double murder, like we said, the public had connected Richard and Polly's and Paul and Betty's. So that's when you started seeing a little bit of public fear. Curfews were urged, and the city council suggested that residents not be caught outside past midnight, and even suggested that nightclubs close at midnight, and this was in an attempt to, to keep people off the streets at dark. Gonzalez said the killer was clearly a maniac, but said that it was meaningless to pass, like, ordinances and laws that would, like, tell young people that they couldn't be out past a certain um, time of night and not to go park or do all these late night activities. Like he thought that was just sort of pointless to him. Quote, they know the possible consequences as well as I do now. Herbert Wren, a Sunday school teacher who lived in Texarkana at this time, described the, the aftermath of these latest double murders and the effect it had on the community. Quote, it changed our community overnight. Before that, youngsters never felt threatened or uncomfortable anywhere. Now young people suddenly were in potential danger at night almost anywhere. And it did seem that like the young people and like the teens and stuff of the town, they did do as they were urged. It was reported that like parking on dark, secluded roads was all but abandoned. And the nightlife in the town started suffering. Like people weren't going to clubs as much. They weren't going to midnight movies or anything like that. And Gonzalez said that this case was one of the most puzzling cases he had in his 30 years in law enforcement and said that the murderer was a quote, a shrewd criminal who's left no stone unturned in concealing his identity. He told the press that they were interviewing suspects as far away as 100 miles. And at this point in time, within a couple of days after the murders, the reward grew to a staggering $3,000. Police would interview, of course, several friends, relatives, and family of Paul and Betty, those who were at the dance that night, and anyone in the area who had a criminal record. Oh yeah, you better believe they were questioned. Like I said, they, they were just kind of throwing shit at the wall to see what stuck. They were interviewing anybody and everybody. Now, what made working the investigation a little chaotic was just how many law enforcement officials were now in town at this point. There wasn't even enough room for them all to sit in at the sheriff's office. So Gonzalez ended up making a deal with Jim Wilson, and he was one of the owner of Boyd's Drugs, which was a popular, popular, excuse me, local hangout in the town. And it was only like half a block away from the sheriff's office. And Jim allowed Gonzalez and his rangers to meet in his large, spacious, storeroom in the back. There was also a door that opened into a back alley of the store, and it was just the perfect locale for rangers to be able to go in and out, discuss the case, and have there be like a clear entry and exit point. You know what I mean? It was thought that the rangers wanted to have a place to discuss the case away from the Texarkana officials on both sides. And this is where the rangers would, yeah, primarily discuss the case. In one of the meetings, It was they were discussing ways to lure out the killer since it seemed like he was preying on couples parked in cars. And it was said a plan was, was developed to try to lure the killer out with police officers posing in cars. And they would be posing with female mannequins and, you know, acting like, like a couple who was parking in an attempt to bait the killer. And they would like park in all like the known makeout spots. They um, really stuck heavily to Spring Lake Park since that's where the most current murders had happened. They even went so far as to bring in mannequins from like outside the area because they didn't want 
any word of this plan to leak out, right? Like, you don't know who the killer is. What if it's some, like, citizen who's following what's going on, right? So that's how far they went in trying to lure the killer out and keep everything under wraps. Some newspaper articles said that Captain Gonzalez even went so far as to recruit local teens to sit in cars as armed officers waited nearby. Um, I, I, the book didn't say anything about that, but that was what initial newspaper articles that were released at that time period said. But even though they did this, no suspects would emerge. Officers assigned to this case would work in 24-hour relays. And after about four days of the investigation, Gonzalez got everyone in a lather when he told them to be ready for an update in the case. So there was one suspect that Gonzalez publicly stated was of special interest to them. It was a cab driver, and his cab had supposedly been seen in the vicinity of the murders. But later that same day, Gonzalez had to come out and say that the driver had been washed out as a suspect. So yeah, when this like major update failed to materialize, right, that Gonzalez had promised them, people started complaining about how long the investigation was taking. Why hadn't they found anyone yet? How was there like no suspects? And they also thought that the police were maliciously keeping information away from them, the public. Gonzalez, though, just reiterated just how tough this case was said how they were working in 24-hour increments to try and solve this case, and that he had the entire resources of the Department of Public Safety at his disposal. Like, don't worry, we're going to solve this. Now, it was after these double murders of Paul and Betty that the press would come up with the moniker The Phantom Killer. So editor John Quincy Mahaffey, who was the editor at the Texarkana Gazette, recognized that they needed like a, a shorthand like slash moniker for this killer. Because remember, within days, the public had connected these two, right? And, you know, just calling them the Texarkana murders wasn't enough to distinguish them from the other crime that filled the city. So city editor Calvin Sutton came up with the solution. Quote, we've got to have a handle for the killer. How about calling him the Phantom? He has been elusive like a phantom. And Mahaffey liked this idea. Quote, why not? The son of a bitch continues to elude capture. He certainly can be called a phantom. And the first time the phantom killer was run in the press was actually on the Tuesday of Paul and Betty funerals. That was the first time the press had used the Phantom Killer. And this was a name that would stick to this case like glue, the Phantom Killer of Texarkana. And with fear gripping the community, this being a smaller community, and the murders being all anyone talked about, of course, rumors ran rampant. There were rumors going around that Betty's body had been like horribly mutilated, like her breasts had been chewn up, and like all this like really bizarre, gruesome stuff that wasn't true. One of the more prominent rumors was that like a minister had turned in his son as the killer. And it was just, it, it was a lot. It was just all anybody was talking about. Everyone pointed the finger at everyone else. And Gonzalez, like he warned against all these rumors going around. He tried to caution the public saying all they did was hinder the investigation and that people just needed to like calm their shit, you know? Quote, things of that kind do the investigation no good. Rumors are vicious things and great injustices can be done by too much loose talk. He also added that like this case had spread so much that two women had come forward with information they had gleaned from their dreams. There was a black man who the book just called Sammy who was also questioned and seriously looked at as a suspect. So in addition to the footprints at the scene, there were of course tire tracks and they were believed to belong to the killer's vehicle. So of course, plaster were taken of them, right? Well, it turns out these tire tracks matched Sammy's car. So, of course, he was brought in for questioning. He was 35 years old, had a clean record, likable personality, had a pretty good reputation around town. And he denied knowing anything about the murders, said he didn't own a 32 Colt or any other type of 32 caliber weapon. And he begged them, like, dude, let me take a polygraph. Let me show you. Like, I'm, I'm not the phantom killer. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I swear to God, it's not me. Unfortunately, he failed the polygraph examination three times. But it said, even after all of this, Sheriff Presley wasn't really all that convinced that Sammy was their guy. After all, this guy had a stellar reputation, wasn't known to be violent. But, you know, he did have to admit that, like, oh, when he was denying being there, when his tire tracks put him there, and now he's failing the polygraph, there's got to be something going on here. So not wanting to charge a man with capital murder on circumstantial evidence, 
which was just really bizarre because this is a black man. We're in 1940s, like, you know, Texas slash Arkansas. You've got a big murder case and now you've got like this, this black guy who looks like a good suspect, like pretty shocked that Presley didn't just like jump on that, right? But anyway... Presley was not really all convinced. So he decided to get Travis Elliott, who was a psychologist, to put Sammy under hypnosis and see what happened from that. He knew this wouldn't be like admissible in court or anything like that, but he just thought maybe this could at least like shrug off any lingering doubts that Sammy is our guy, you know? Like, I don't think Presley really bought it all that much. So he wanted something, anything that could point to someone else and not waste their time on Sammy. So both Travis and Sammy agreed to this. And when he went under, it turned out Sammy was really just trying to hide an affair that he had going on with a married woman. So under hypnosis, Sammy said that Saturday night, he and a friend um, hung out, drank a little bit, and they had cut through Spring Lake Park that night to take his buddy home. On his way back, he said he stopped on the road to take a pee. And then he drove to the west side of the park to where the married woman that he was seeing lived. He saw the light go out at her house, meaning that her husband was leaving for work, so he decided to go talk to her. And they talked for some time, and then he left there and went home. And after corroborating his story and everything, police then released Sammy, saying that he was not their guy. Meanwhile, with no suspects emerging and any lead being quickly dismissed, you know, like checked out, the fear just grew. Sporting goods stores reported that they were selling out of guns and ammunition very quickly, while theaters said that they were playing to empty seats. And attendance to nightclubs, establishments, and that kind of thing, like, was pretty much to zero. It severely dropped. Shades also started being drawn on windows, and doors started to be locked, which, remember, was uncommon. And I thought this was funny, so in one newspaper article, it was saying, like, women's clubs and groups and civic clubs and activities were being canceled, and, quote, husbands were report their wives won't let them leave the home at night. Yeah. So when you have fear and a lot of guns and people wanting to, you know, get justice, you know, get get this killer, it is said Texarkana became kind of a dangerous place to live at this time, even for police. Max Tackett was an Arkansas state trooper, and he was a state trooper at, at this time, and he described what it was like. Quote, people armed themselves and were quick to shoot. The biggest danger for a policeman was the chance of getting shot by good citizens. It was just risking death to go out then with civilian clothes on. It was said the city these youth were the most fearful of the community because it was like the phantom was attacking them. And the adults didn't really do anything to assuage their fears because they were also worried about their kids, right? Tom, remember Paul's friend, said, quote, if we went anywhere at night, we took guns with us and went in groups, usually to each other's homes. Sometimes we'd go to a movie, but always as a group. There was no parking in cars anymore. Six days into the investigation, the reward jumped to $4,770. And at this point, it was, it wasn't just residents. It was like local businesses, businesses from other communities, like outside the city, even outside the state were contributing. Like, yeah, dude, the fear was spreading. And after a week had passed with no suspects, no progress, despite Gonzalez's claim to the contrary, fear was still gripping the community. And there was actually a lot of like clubs and like organizations that were urging the city council to actually pass an 11 p.m. curfew in the town. And at this point in time, the reward climbed to $5,000. And 10 days after the murders, with people still on edge and still no suspects, both city councils on the Arkansas and the Texas side decided to pass ordinances establishing a midnight curfew on public amusement spots. And other city officials said that they were even toying with the idea of passing a 9 p.m. curfew for people under 16. The reward at this point in time had climbed to $5,500 and $80. Yeah, the reward just kept climbing higher and higher. Then on Saturday, April 27th, it was thought there was a huge break. Finally, finally, police had arrested a 30-year-old Fort Worth, Texas man in North Beach, Texas, and it was on suspicions that he may be connected to the murders. So North Beach is located in Corpus Christi, Texas, which was about 450 miles away, and the man was arrested on a disturbing the peace charge as he brandished a gun at a hotel clerk with whom he was arguing. Additionally, this man also matched the description of a man who had attempted to sell a alto saxophone, a Bundy type, which was the type Betty saxophone was, at a music shop in downtown Paris, Texas. This had occurred on April 20th. 
apparently the man didn't have like the saxophone on him. He had just like described it to the clerk. And when the clerk said that she had to go like talk to her manager, that's when he started acting like kind of nervous. And he told her that she just needed to accept the saxophone. Quote, what do you have to talk to him about it for? You work here, don't you? And when she like ignored him and, you know, headed back to get her manager, the man hurriedly left the music shop. Like, and again, it was the way he was acting. It was just really off. So the clerk and the manager ended up calling the police to let them know. Detective Lieutenant Ike Elif learned that the man had actually purchased a 45 caliber single action revolver at another pawn shop in North Beach. And when he was arrested, not only did he have this gun on him, his clothes had blood on them. The man told the Texas Rangers who interviewed him that he'd gotten into a brawl at a bar and that's where the blood had come from. Texas Ranger Marrow Wiley Williamson interviewed the man and he stated that if this man ended up matching the description of the man who had attempted to sell that saxophone, they would send him to Texarkana to be questioned. Two more Texas Rangers named Joe Thompson and Truman Stone, who was a criminal investigator with the Rangers, flew to North Beach to question the man. As did Joe S. Fletcher, who was the assistant to Homer Garrison of the Department of Safety. And as they all swooped down to interview the man and see if if this was the phantom killer, other officers were trying to track down the music store clerk because they needed her to identify him. By that following Tuesday, April 30th, the clerk did positively identify the man that they had in custody as the one who had attempted to sell the saxophone. The man's vehicle was also found in Richmond, Texas, which authorities, of course, combed through looking for any evidence. But by Thursday, May 2nd, Gonzalez had to come out and publicly state that this guy was probably not their guy. Quote, everything the man tells us is being checked and double checked and everything he has told us thus far has been found to be true. He has answered all our questions without hesitancy. We are convinced that thus far the man has told the truth and if all of his story is found to be true, we can no longer hold him as a suspect. The man had told police that he had done some extensive traveling the last three weeks and that's why he had dropped his car off in Richmond to be worked on. Authorities did take casts of his uh, tires, but they didn't match the tracks that were found at the crime scene. Eventually, the man was let go. And by that point in time, the reward had reached $7,025. And this was after then Texas Governor Coke Stevenson offered an additional $500, $250 per each double murder. And what really had people on edge was they're like, okay, Richard and Polly were murdered. And then like three weeks later, there was Betty and Paul. Oh my God, is, is the killer going to strike three weeks later? So, you know, at the point in time between Paul and Betty's murder and what we'll get into, people were on edge. They were like, oh my God, the three week mark is coming. Three week mark is coming. Like the phantom killer is going to come. Like, is he going to stick to the schedule? You know, that's really what... Um, sort of like put fuel on the fire of this fear. And then on Friday, May 3rd, sometime before 9 p.m., Walter Virgil Starks, he went by Virgil, who was 37 years old, and his wife, Catherine Katie Isla Strickland Starks, who was 36, were in their six-bedroom home in Homan, Arkansas. They had a 500-acre farm located off Highway 67 East, about 10 miles northeast of Texarkana, and to the east of their home was a barn and some cultivated land. Now, though the home was set off about 100 feet off the highway and it was mostly concealed. One side of it was in plain view for anyone traveling the Highway 67. The couple had lived here for five years and they had been raised in the Red Springs community, which was west of Texarkana on the Texas side. The couple had known each other practically their whole lives and in March of 1946, that year, they had actually celebrated their 14th wedding anniversary. They had married on March 2nd, 1932. In addition to running the farm, Virgil also had a welding shop, while Katie tended to the home home and the yard and had a large social circle. Now at this time period, it wasn't really all that common for the rural areas, like the rural homes to have electricity, but the Starks did. And they also had another rare novelty for rural areas at that time, which was a telephone, like like a, one of those like crank telephones. So that Friday, May 3rd, 1946, was just another long laborious day for Virgil. So that evening after dinner, he retreated to the living room in the southwest corner of the house. He sat in his armchair and applied a heating pad to his lower back. It was pretty sore from the day's work. He turned on the radio, listened to his program, and opened the newspaper, the Texarkana Gazette. Behind him, the window shade was halfway pulled down, covering the upper part of the closed double window with a section of the curtain draped to 
to one side. The house was surrounded by shrubs, and it reached up to the bottom of the windowsill. And as Virgil was in the living room, Katie was in the kitchen doing the dishes. Meanwhile, well before 9 p.m. that evening, when, you know, Virgil is kicking back, relaxing, and Katie's doing the dishes, Arkansas State Troopers Max Tackett and Charlie Boyd drove by the Stark home on the highway. They were on their way from Texarkana to Hope, where the district headquarters for the state police were located, to drop off a monthly expense reports. And they had a deadline. If they didn't drop off these reports by 10 p.m. that evening, they would lose the whole month's reimbursement. So as they drove north along the highway, Tackett noticed that on their right, there sat an old model car. It was parked across the railroad tracks, like parallel to them, off a dirt road about a thousand feet past the Starks farm that they had passed. This was near a road that led to a large stretch of woods called the Big Woods. Now, this spot was apparently known for buyers of like bootleggers and like bootleg, you know, moonshine whiskey and stuff to meet up. So that's why I think uh, Tackett made note of it. And Tackett saw as they were passing it that from the way that it was parked, it looked like it was heading north from Texas. Arcana. And that was all he could really detail by driving by it in the dark. Now, normally, they would have stopped right then and there to, you know, inspect the car and check it out. But remember, this night, they were in a hurry. So Tackett just told Boyd, like, hey, we're gonna have to check this car out on our way back home. So let's, let's make a note of it. Meanwhile, at his home, Virgil continued nursing his sore back, listening to his radio program, reading the paper. With his back, remember... Uh, to the window. Katie had finished the dishes at this point and had changed into her pajamas. She was getting ready for bed and she laid down in the bed and that's when she called to her husband, quote, why don't you come on to bed? And then Virgil just responded to her, quote, as soon as this story ends on the radio. He just wanted to listen to the rest of his program and then he'd head to bed. And then a moment later, Katie heard a noise in the backyard and she said, quote, Virgil, turn down the radio a little. I hear a noise outside. But Katie would unfortunately never know if her husband ever heard her. A minute or two later, as Virgil was sitting in the living room, he was shot twice in the back of the head with the shot coming from behind him from that window. The killer made two holes in the window and fired each shot subsequently. So it was like, bam, bam, real quick. One of the bullets actually went through the heating pad, short circuiting it. Now hearing the sound of broken glass, Katie came into the room. She thought maybe her husband had like dropped something. And as she came into the room, she saw Virgil stand back, stand up out of the chair. And then he immediately slumped back down. She saw blood running down his neck. A pool of blood was already forming. And then she noticed the two holes in the window pane. And remember at this point in time, It's dark outside, but inside the Starks' home, lights were on. So if you were outside the window looking into the home, you had a perfect view. But if you're inside the lit home, you couldn't see out there in the dark. Now, after rushing to her husband, lifting his head and seeing that he was like dead or near dead, Katie ran to the wall crank telephone. She managed to get it ringing twice before she too was shot twice. Both times in the face, one bullet entered her right cheek near her nose and emerged from behind her left ear, and the other shot entered her lower jaw just below her lip and breaking her lower jaw. The bullet ended up lodged underneath her tongue, and both shots had crashed through her teeth, scattering fragments of them all over the floor. Can you imagine, guys? Can you imagine? And both shots had come from that same window. Now, the book I read said that she didn't even get a chance to crank the telephone at all, that as soon as she reached the telephone, that was when she was shot. Katie immediately fell to the floor and was stunned for a moment. Miraculously, she was not dead. And even in her, in her, present state how she was, she had the presence of mind to stay close to the floor. And she was like, okay, I'm gonna get on my hands and knees and try to keep out of view of the window because she knew that's where the shots had come from. And she was hoping by crawling on her hands and knees very quietly, the killer would hopefully think that he got her and take off. She inched her way back towards the house. She was going to try and get a 45 revolver that they kept in a back bedroom and a dresser drawer back there. She did have difficulty navigating though, because remember guys, I just described like the shots that she received. She like was shot in her freaking face and like blood is just pouring everywhere. So like, of course her vision is severely impaired. And when she thought she was out of view of the window, she then miraculously managed to get up to her feet to head to the bedroom and the gun. Now, I don't know if it was just like her scattered thoughts or if she didn't know where like the bedroom was due to like all of like the blood 
pouring in her eyes and the shock she was going through or what. But instead of going to the, the back bedroom to attempt to find the gun, she instead opened the door to the kitchen. And that's when she heard who she presumed to be the killer at the back door. Now, the book I read said that as she opened the kitchen door, that's when she heard a noise at the back door of the kitchen. And she immediately thought like, oh my God, he's trying to get in. The, the shooter is trying to get in. And just as she entered through the kitchen door, she heard the man trying to enter the house through the kitchen window and then actually saw him climbing through a window at the screened in back porch. And then the book says that she actually saw the man's leg and knee like come through the window. And it was at that point you know, panicked and still half blinded with blood. She ran back, half stumbling back, and she ran into a bedroom, through a passageway, then through another bedroom, through the living room, and bolted out the front door. She was barefoot, and her only thoughts that were running through her head at this time was that she had to flee. The killer was coming inside for her. She ran to her sister and brother-in-law's house, Jeff and Betty Allen, which was right across the highway, across the railroad tracks, about 200 yards away. But unfortunately for Katie, no no one was home. So she then ran to another neighbor's house, A.V. Prater, who lived about 50 yards away from the Allen's home. She managed to shout out, quote, Virgil's dead before collapsing on the Prater's front porch. A.V. then shot a rifle into the air to signal another neighbor. This neighbor was Elmer Taylor, and A.V. told Elmer that he needed help, that Elmer needed to go bring around his car so they could take Katie to the hospital. And so that's what Elmer did. And with Elmer driving along with the entire Prater family and Katie, they drove her to the hospital specifically to Michael Meager Hospital, and it's now known as Miller County Health Unit. And it was about 10 miles away. And so as Katie was, was being helped and was being worked on at the hospital, the troopers Tackett and Boyd had crossed the Red River Bridge and were back in Miller County when they got the call on their radio of what had happened at the Starks Farm. They had already passed the Starks home at this point. They were about five miles past it when they got the call. And the old model car that they had wanted to inspect was gone by that time. So due to their proximity, Tackett and Boyd were the first officers on scene at the Starks farm. So upon entering the home and the living room where Virgil lay, the smell of smoke filled the room. The heating pad had actually caused a small fire and the armchair that Virgil was sitting in was actually smoldering. smoldering. But fortunately, his body had not been burned. Tackett and Boyd did their best to preserve the crime scene. But within like mere minutes, dozens and dozens of officers would descend on the scene. And according to Tackett, they stomped out any potential evidence as officers were just getting in each other's way. So many officials from both sides of, like, both uh, from Arkansas and Texas sides came and just descended onto the scene, and it was chaos. Miller County, Arkansas Sheriff W.E. L.V. Davis, his chief deputy Tillman Johnson, and Deputy Bill Scott were among the first officers on scene after Tackett and Boyd, and they attested to the, the chaos that just filled the scene. Chief Deputy Johnson said, quote, by the time LV and I got there, it was a three ring circus. It was a carnival. There were already a lot of people, including officers around when we arrived. Max and Charlie were there. It's Tackett and Boyd. The city police were already there. Buzz Hallett and Dewey Presley from the FBI were there. Neighbors had started pouring in. The house was wide open. Soon, people were tromping all over. I tried to seal off the scene, but by then, much had probably been lost. Can you imagine? I feel like with a lot of these old cases that happen like way back when this is usually one of the common threads in the cold cases is that like the crime scene is just not preserved properly. When she was in the operating room, Katie would end up being interviewed by Sheriff Davis, who would become the head of this investigation. She recounted the events to him, quote, Virgil was sitting in a chair with his back to the window, listening to a radio program. I was laying in the next room on a bed. I heard a noise in the backyard and asked Virgil to turn the radio down a bit. The next thing I heard sounded like the breaking of glass. I thought he had dropped something and went into his room. When I reached the doorway, he was standing up. Suddenly, he slumped into a chair and I saw the blood. I ran over to him and then I ran to the telephone. I rang it twice. And that was when she had been shot. She said not only could she hear the killer at her back door to the kitchen, she heard him tear out the screen from like their screened in back porch. And as the scene began being worked on, other officers started converging on the local neighbors and the local community, seeing if anybody had heard or seen anything. Neighbors were, were horrified. They described the Starks as just like average citizens. No one had any like known grounds 
grudges or anything with them. They didn't have any known enemies or shady dealings or anything like that. And they could offer no reason why this would happen to them. Inside the Stark's home, investigators had found the trail of blood that Katie had left behind, along with bits of her broken teeth and footprints from the killer. He had gotten inside the home as Katie had fled. So it's a good thing she had bolted when she did. In fact, due to the recent rains and and mud, police were actually able to follow the killer's footprints from the moment he set out to murder the Starks. When police brought out bloodhounds, they caught the killer scent at the front door, but it ended at the highway, leaving them to believe that he had gotten away in some sort of vehicle. So the footprints began on a road almost a mile southeast of the Starks' home. And from there, the killer had walked directly north, crossing the railroad tracks and Highway 67, and went into the big woods that bordered the Starks' farm. It bordered the Starks' farm on the east. He then turned due west, choosing to walk half a mile in very thick, suctioning mud rather than risk the highway. And as he had approached the Starks' farm, he had kept the barn between himself and the Starks' home. The police said at no time did he go around the home to determine the number of occupants inside, leading them to believe that the killer knew it was just Virgil and Katie there. He had hid behind some shrubs, had shot Virgil about 18 to 20 inches from the window where he could see the back of his head. And after he had shot Katie, the killer had dropped the red flashlight he had been carrying, ran to the rear of the house, and that is when Katie had heard him tearing out at the uh, screened back porch. They did end up finding that red flashlight that the killer had left behind. It was in the hedge um, beneath the window from which he had fired from. It was theorized that he had set it down to take aim at Virgil. And in the surprise of Katie entering the room and like shooting at her, he had left it behind in his hurry to get around to the back of the house. Now, after she had fled, the killer had gotten through the porch, had gotten inside the home through a kitchen window, and he followed Katie's blood trail, leaving behind muddy footprints. He passed through her bedroom where her purse was lying open with money and jewelry out. He didn't touch any of it. The killer then walked to where Virgil lay dead in his armchair. And he stood here a moment and smeared his hands in the blood on the floor. He then left the home, traveling southeastward about 200 yards across the highway and walked along the side of the railroad tracks and walked about a quarter of the mile away until he presumably got into his vehicle and left. And that was where dogs had lost his scent. And Tackett and Boyd would end up going to their graves believing that that car that they had seen on their way to Hope that night was the killer's vehicle. Police also found three empty 22 caliber shell casings at the scene, but they were too battered to be like definitively identified. But they were able to tell they come from an automatic or a semi-automatic weapon. And this was due to the closest of the bolt holes left behind in the window. It was theorized the weapon was an old model 22 Colt Woodsman. Apparently, many officers felt that it had come from a rifle, but they couldn't be sure that the shots also hadn't come from a pistol. And all in all, the killer had about a 55 minute head start on police. And that is where we will end part one of the Phantom Killer. And oh my god, isn't this wild? Isn't this wild? This is stuff that always like is creepy, man, when you have these like mass attacks like this, isn't it? wild. Oh my god. So next time we meet in part two, we'll get more into the investigation of the Starks murder. We'll get into suspects. We'll get into Mary and Jimmy's attack. Is it related? We'll get all into that. And yeah, man, we are not done with this case. There's so much more to get into. And until we meet again for part two, I hope you take care of yourself out there. I hope you have a happy and safe and fun Halloween. I know last time we met, I said I hadn't watched any Halloween stuff because I was like in the middle of like a One Piece marathon, which I still am. But I have watched some Halloween material. I watched the the Fall of the House of Usher, the Mike Flanagan series on Netflix. Oh my God. I love Mike Flanagan. Let me know if you've watched any of his stuff. He did The uh, Haunting of Hill House, Haunting of Bly Manor, Midnight Mass, and now The Fall of the House of Usher, based on a lot of Edgar Allan Poe works. Oh my god, it's like my favorite. I love Mike Flanagan so, so much. Love him. Check out his work on Netflix. He's so awesome. He's now got a contract with Amazon Prime. 
and he's going to do the Dark Tower series. I'm so excited. I love that book series. It's one of my favorites. But yeah, that is, that, that's my Halloween watch for the year. It was the fall of the House of Usher. And now I'm on a total Flanagan kick as well. So let me know, what are y'all watching? What are y'all doing for Halloween? I hope it's fun and safe, whatever you choose to do. And yeah, I guess I will go ahead and leave it there. It's getting a little stuffy in here. We're still pretty warm here in SoCal still pretty hot. So I'll go ahead and leave it there. Take care of yourselves out there. Remember, when you're out there in the world, interacting with other human beings, don't be a dick. Don't be a douche, all right? Leave a little sparkle wherever you go. Oh, whoops. And real quick, before we sign off, remember, this is the book that I used for my research, The Phantom Killer by James Presley. It has quite of a, a mouthful of a title there, but yeah, you can you can see it there. But yeah, this is the book I read. Just wanted to plug that. Totally forgot. And now I will go ahead and leave you all off and I will see you in November. Have a happy Halloween. Bye-bye.